Julian, you wrote, I'm sick of people telling me that I have promise. Adam, you wrote, I think I need to accept that my life isn't going to be very exciting. You don't know. I'm going to be on television. I got a call and an application. And Come on, Ma. Maybe you're not, but you're definitely going to be at the podcast. I'm George from Austria. I'm Kurt from the UK. I'm Bia from Portugal. And today we are discussing The Whale, Requiem for a Dream, and Vortex. Kicking it off with The Whale. What were you guys' thoughts on it? I assume you guys are pretty familiar with Aronofsky's filmography. I haven't seen all of them, but I've I've seen enough. Yes, yeah, same. I watched The Whale first at the Viennale Film Festival last year, and I was super excited for it. Seen all of his other movies before. Big fan of his. I don't think he is quite the most consistent director. I have my fair amount of problems with some of his other films, but I absolutely fell in love with this. I think now coming back to the movie, some parts of it definitely were due to uh, the general experience of being at a big film festival for the first time, being in a 700 people crowd experiencing a movie for the first time, um, having this general feeling of community there. But I still love it. I th still got very emotional this time around. I've heard quite some criticism about this movie since then. And I gotta say, I have some arguments about against some of the criticisms made, but I'm looking forward to what you guys think of it. I actually didn't see this for a while. I think it ended up being on my top 10 films of last year, but that's like completely in retrospect. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I didn't get around to actually seeing it last year. All I had known about this film was one, it was Aronofsky who I like maybe a grand total of one or two movies from. <laughs> so I wasn't racing to see it. Also, I love Brendan Fraser, but it did feel like people were overpraising his performance simply because it was a comeback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wasn't rushing to see it then either. So I was like, yeah, you know, it's whatever. I'll get around to it when I get around to it. So earlier this year, I eventually watched it with my girlfriend and I really like it, like a lot. I think it's my favorite Aronofsky. Mm -hmm. The hype behind Brendan Fraser's performance is completely justified, completely. It's not just a comeback performance. It is a great performance. Oh, for sure. I think I said this when we were talking about the Oscars before, but I think his performance is easily the best thing about the entire movie. And I think without it, it's nowhere near as good of a movie. Yeah, I think actually you could generalize it to the performances are the best thing about this movie. Yeah, I wouldn't stop at Brendan Fraser, but I'm, I can see your point, yeah. It's funny because... I do agree that Brandon Fraser's performance um, was probably, you know, the one thing that carried the movie on. But about the other ones, I don't think that they did much for, you know, improving the quality of the movie at all. Interesting. Especially Sadie Sink and the um, Mormon guy. I don't remember his name. Mm -hmm. um, and the wife as well. Just the performances that were given by them felt really flat, but that didn't take away from the movie, like from me enjoying the movie. I did quite enjoy it, though uh, I had this feeling that I was watching a play because it, it is adapted from a play, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was times that it was very obvious that... It was an adaptation from a play and I couldn't take my head off it and the vibes were off and then I had to force myself to get back into the movie. But apart from that, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, I think on that one, I disagree with the performances slightly. 
I do think Sadie Sink is fine. You know, she she's okay. Same with Ty Simpkins, I think his name is. Who plays Thomas the Mormon, whatever. But Hong Chow, I think I think that's how you say mm-hmm. her name. Um, yeah, who plays I... Liz, the carer. Mm-hmm. Um, she, yeah, she is, is incredible. Yeah, when I say the wife, I was not referring. She was the the one good performance out of, you know, apart from Brendan Fraser. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. just wanted to put that out there. But also with the stage mm-hmm. production mm-hmm. thing, I really noticed it as well. You really notice it when you kind of realize that the whole film is set basically in the one apartment. You know, when it's a stage play, you know, as a yeah. theater kid, I can say as a stage play, it really helps when the entire thing is set in one place, right? Because it's really difficult to change locations unless you're a massive, massive production. Oh, yeah, sure. So that makes sense for the stage show and it would work really well for a stage show. Mm -hmm. However, in a film, unless that one location is giving you a lot, it's hard. It's really difficult. And in in this film, the location is really boring. It's not even sad, you know, like how I would expect it to be. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of nothing. And it could have been so much better. But here's the thing. I heard that cris- criticism before, and I totally agree that you can feel it was obviously a theater piece before. It is all taking place in that one location, basically. But I feel like that really adds to and works for this story. The whole thing about it is that this one room is basically his world. He can't really leave it anymore. He is tied to those four walls, basically. He can't, you know, he's he's not physically able no, to absolutely. get up and adventure around or whatever. That's his environment. So it totally makes sense that yeah, it, it makes traps sense. us in there with him. I'm okay with it being one location. My problem is is that mm. it's that location. That's the set that yeah, they it's built. It's more of the an, an execution problem. Yeah, I ju- a, I just feel yeah. like the, either the location isn't great or Aronofsky himself didn't present it in a way that was pleasing either. If that makes sense. You know, I just don't I don't feel like it was maybe. You know, if you maybe. swapped out that apartment for any other apartment, it wouldn't have made a difference. And I feel like because he's stuck in that apartment, it should feel like its own character. You know, like it should be an important part of the story because that is his world. You should not be able to just exchange that apartment for, say, the fucking Friends studio apartment. And it'd be exactly the same. I feel like the apartment should Mm -hmm. be integral to the story, and I don't think it is. Yeah, it could. I, I don't really have an argument against it, to be honest. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it either, So though. So I... To me, it's like... Imagine if a Batman film was set in just regular New York rather than Gotham. You know what I mean? Like, Gotham is its own thing. Mm-hmm. So though it may not be the most interesting part of the movie, it, it's necessary. You know, the backdrop is is part of the personality. And yeah, I, I think see. it's the same I in the world. The apartment should be the Gotham. But it isn't. It's just New York. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I feel like uh, Charlie as a character is very much portrayed as someone who just wants the most basic necessities around him to make ends need, meet because... He has other goals, you know. He doesn't want to spend money. He wants to save up that money for his daughter. He, he doesn't splurge. He he doesn't like ever get himself something special. So it kind of makes sense that it is a bland, whatever apartment. He just needs something. I get that. I mean, I just I'm just head, thinking basically. like in my head, trying to remember that apartment. I couldn't pick out one singular thing about it. Like, I couldn't tell you what the walls look like. I couldn't tell you where any shelves are or where tables and stuff are. I can remember literally where the TV is and 
the kitchen. I can't remember where the TV is. I'm yeah, like, like, I remember where the sofa is. I remember the dining table, <laughs> the kitchen, the shelf, the other sofa. And then you mentioned the TV, and I'm like, yeah, wh- where, where was yeah, the it's TV? Yeah, ju- it's just so lacking, I, I feel like. You know, it doesn't have to be a crazy production or anything. It, I think it maybe it's to do with the lighting, maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, I get it's supposed to be dark and dingy and whatever, but there's a way to do that and also make it appealing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't have any problems with that, but I can see how it would be. But honestly, other than that, I don't... I don't really have much criticism for the film. I, I don't think the, the script is too strong. I think is absolutely carried by the performances. Mm-hmm. And I don't think the directing is necessarily great. I think it's very boring and bland at, at most points. Yeah. And I again, it's, it's yeah. absolutely aided by the performances. It's a completely performance driven film. And I think Aronofsky landed very lucky getting the actors that he did. So, but. You can definitely give him some credit for casting those people oh yeah like, it's not it's not the first thing that comes to mind to cast brendan fraser for that role you know it's a very emotionally exhausting performance and you would yeah. probably have other actors come to mind first and somehow he got the idea and found like the the perfect fit in brendan fraser so i i yeah. still think that's part of directing that kind of gets underappreciated on that note, just real quick, because I also was thinking about that the entire time, because I, re- I saw a clip of Brendan Fraser talking about being cast in that film, and it was Aronofsky just insisting that he's the one he wants, mm-hmm. which is crazy to have that foresight to all do credit to him. But um, who, who would you have cast, dream cast, like, for Charlie? Yeah, that's the thing. I don't, I can't really see anyone other than Brendan Fraser and as Charlie now, <laughs> in a retro perspective, I'm I'm really struggling to to I come up with the, someone. See, because this is what's crazy is I in the perfect cast in my head for Charlie. Um, I mean, sadly he's passed, but Philip to Seymour. me, yeah, Philip Seymour. I was yeah, just yeah, thinking yeah. of that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, and to it is. think that Brendan Fraser is in that same conversation as. Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's insane. Yeah, yeah is genuinely insane. Because that's one of the he's one of the best actors of all time. Yeah, for sure. He's one of the most underappreciated, but definitely one of the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's huge praise to Brendan Fraser to even be there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I've I feel like Philip Seymour Hoffman would have brought an absolute Yeah, true, true. Raw yeah, it would be really yeah. I think it would have been a different movie, honestly. Yeah. Better, better. I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, that's we we will never know. But it definitely would have been a different movie. But that's straight away who I thought was perfect for that role, other than Brendan Fraser. Mm-hmm. I agree. One more thing about the presentation that I can get into before we get to spoiler talk. I heard the criticism before that the aspect ratio seemed random and just forcefully trying to be artsy whilst lacking in other artful mm. departments uh, and no. i fully disagree with the statement yeah, yeah same same not only do i think it is okay to just pick whatever aspect ratio you'd like you don't necessarily need to have an explanation for it yeah, yeah but i also feel like this movie has a strong reason to use a uh, narrow yeah. aspect mm-hmm. ratio for the pure fact that there's so many shots in this movie where Brendan Fraser's body pretty much and like he he spans over the whole film there's yeah. there's shots where they mm-hmm. are pretty wide but they manage to fill the screen from left to right just with Brendan Fraser's body which you well, couldn't yeah. at all do in cinemascope and just this percent wise big amount of screen he takes over with his body just makes him feel that much bigger it it adds so much to the yeah to the I whole think thing it's, it's to one emphasize brennan fraser's uh size in that film mm-hmm. not brennan fraser's size charlie's size charlie's size yeah 
It's also to make the whole film claustrophobic. Yeah, feels feel small. Like. Yeah, For sure. the whole film feels tiny because that's what his world is. Mm-hmm. You know, his friend circle's tiny. The apartment is tiny. You know, everything about it is just small because he is so large. Mm-hmm. So I feel like the aspect ratio really sells that, but also exactly what you just said. Even if that wasn't the reason, who gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to make if you want to make a film in that aspect ratio, do it. Who cares? No one no one complained when Zack Schneider did it for the Schneider cut, which absolutely has no reason to. <laughs> it's black and white and in like 4/3. Like it's so it doesn't need to be. Yeah. It's a Batman and Superman movie. But he wanted to and no one cared. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't know why that's suddenly a problem. But yeah, no, it's stupid. It's an awful criticism of the film. Mm-hmm. I think there's many valid criticisms of this film, and that is not one of them, even in the slightest. Yeah. I think that the costume design is crazy. Yeah. Like the fat suit that they have for Charlie mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Ridiculously good. Mm. I think it's genuinely the best fat suit I've ever seen. Oh yeah, because it's obviously um, digitally enhanced. Like mm-hmm. you know, they they use a bit of visual effects to help. In particular, because they they also fatted up his face, and yeah. they had to hide sometimes some seams. Where even if you do it perfectly with makeup, if he moves in the wrong way, the seam will yeah. like open up for a bit yeah or like paul or mm-hmm. something like yeah. that yeah like the, the the way they did that is absolutely fantastic it's just a great understanding of using different methods to get the result yeah. you know they are obviously fantastic with makeup and they are obviously fantastic with costumes but they still needed visual effects to not show us visual effects per se but to hide other things but this is the thing like there's always this war between practical and CGI and stuff like that. And I I feel like films are at their best when they use both. Mm-hmm. You know, use them both where it most makes sense. Like, because if they did this film and Charlie was pretty much a fully CGI fat suit, it, it would, would probably look horrend- yeah, horrendous. Yeah, it would fall apart, for sure. But if it was fully practical, it would look like fucking Norbit. Like, it would look really bad. It would probably because feel it, way more than a stage play again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would be really obvious and it wouldn't sell as well. And the thing with this film is you can't have any cracks in that because everything hinges on it. Mm-hmm. So as soon as you kind of recognize that the fat suit isn't real, it's gone. You know, you've pulled up the magic curtain. The marriage between the practical effects and the CGI is ingenious and... If that is also an Aronofsky decision, which it obviously probably is, it's more credit to him again. Mm-hmm. So we're we doing spoilers? I guess so. Spoilers. The, the only other real criticism I picked up on this time around that I had with the story side of it was I feel like the daughter's introduction is very abrupt. I didn't realize the first time yeah. around, but... She she kind of just shows up and is instantly mad at him for basically saying, why should I even care to visit you? But in that moment, she is here. She obviously cared enough to yeah. visit him. But mm-hmm. she instantly wants to leave unless something other happens. So um, if he wouldn't have offered her money, she would have been out in like three minutes, basically. Why Why did she even then come here in the first place did she expect uh, him to pay her it's it's a bit weird and she's just like think... forced in there and once that is done i feel like everything between them works great i just think like the first <laughs> five minutes of her in the story are weird i think she goes because a mother probably told her to right no the mother um, doesn't no, know the mother doesn't oh, know that's doesn't like know. the whole point isn't it yeah oh because the mother doesn't want her to see him. Yeah. She does this behind the back of the mother. Yeah, then she probably does have some curiosity, you know, to get in touch with her father. Mm-hmm. And just doesn't want to admit it. Maybe. And then just, yeah, 
doesn't want to admit it. You know, she's a brat, so. <laughs> this, she is. Okay, what yeah, do you mean? This, yeah. is, this is the thing, right? I like. I don't have much to say about that one specific thing. The daughter character, just in general, Ellie, that's her name, sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Like, is she evil? <laughs> because the movie's obviously trying to tell you she's not. But also, she kind of is. Yeah. I think the movie is kind of telling us that she is, but to show us the basically infinite positivity of Charlie. That that even in her worst doings, he's still th seeing the positive sides. As in, I saw it as that when she when she contacts the parents of the Mormon guy and you know sends the um, the voice message with him saying, "Yeah, I stole that money," and then I ran away and all of that. I kind of have a hard time believing that she did it for anything other than blackmailing him or like being evil, <laughs> but Charlie has no problem seeing the positives in it. I feel like it's all mainly to portray how infinitely positive he is. I can, I can definitely see that. Not only that, for people, there are two sides and that people can choose to act on, and we have this character there's, that is always making the bad decisions and always choosing to put bad into the world. By contrast, we have Charlie that, as you said, like he, is, he has this infinite, never-ending positivity. He's never tired of pushing and trying to break the walls that his daughter is um, is building. You know, she's growing up and building these walls, just playing bad, just you know, trying to be trying to be a baddie. So he knows that behind that facade. There is good. There is the little girl that he created, that he parented all this time. You know, there are two sides to people and people do choose what side they want to show. And he's a believer that he can get her to show, you know, the deep side of her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the little girl that wrote that essay. On the topic of that essay... That essay is not great. Like, <laughs> I I get it, but also it's fine. Like, the, the big reveal is that, oh yeah, this essay is actually written by Ellie, mm -hmm. right? And then that's like the, whoa, she wrote that when she was like 14. Oh, no. It's, n it's not that special. Oh, it's I not that it's special, like, oh my god, she's such a good writer. It's more of a She's putting her opinion, you know, she's being hon honest. And that's why it is special. Not I get because, that, you know, but Charlie also writing. says, yeah, Charlie says it's the best essay like he's ever read or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't think that he means in a literal sense of this is the best literal literature out put out of context if you just give it a critic. I think to him, with all the context he has and knowing who is behind it and what it means that that's the the most important piece of of literature to him you know yeah i, I, I think took it's it more about as that. The, yeah it's about the the honesty again mm -hmm. that is a factor that is important for him when it comes to writing and you know it comes from his daughter so it's Fuck that. probably oh, really special what <laughs> she gets a c plus bro c plus <laughs> <laughs> yeah Fuck that. Was that whole, uh, the essay is hers, a reveal to you guys? Because yeah. I... No. Y you, you saw it coming? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Because it worked for me. I fully expected that the essay was written by his ex-lover. That's, that's where my mind went to. And I heard a lot of people saying the th same thing. But w what did you... How did you pick it up? What did you find out um i mean one i think it's a very obvious stage play thing to do okay because this is the thing right so being a theater kid blah 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 i knew that the essay was going to be somebody that he knows mm -hmm. had to have been yeah right they wouldn't keep bringing back this motif of a random essay on moby dick unless it was something that was very very important to him 
So it has to be someone he knows. Obviously, it's not the Mormon kid. It's yeah. not going to be Dan, the pizza delivery guy. Right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not going to be Liz, quite obviously. So you were left with three options, right? You were either the mother of his kid, his dead husband, or just partner. boyfriend. Yeah. yeah, just I thought his... it was is yeah, like something he wrote. No, 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 something he wrote. What Charlie? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't going to be Charlie. I knew it wasn't going to be Charlie just because I, I don't think he has almost the self confidence. Yeah, the ego. Where something mm. that yeah, something that he wrote would make him feel better. Uh, I didn't give it. I didn't give it much importance at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, so it was like a, a revelation for me uh, that it was her, um, her writing. So, so you kind of just went through the the possible options and you came to the conclusion yourself. Crit is what you're trying to say. Yeah, like so. Obviously, I just knew it was someone going to be close to it. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, when he started to get his daughter to write herself, mm. and he was very in, uh, insisting on her writing. I looked at my girlfriend and I was like, oh, it's going to be her essay, isn't it? Because, mm-hmm. you know, he, I don't think he would push her so hard to write something unless he had already known that she could write something great. Mm-hmm. You know, something great and honest. I can see that, yeah. Because obviously, as you said, the, the main draw of her essay is the honesty of it. Mm-hmm. And that's what he's trying to pull out of her again. Yeah. It's just for her to write something honest. So yeah, I d- uh, I just kind of pieced it together. Yeah, cause cause here's the the big shocker. Apparently, I didn't pay attention this time around to to check, but uh, I was told when you first see the essay, the piece of paper he's reading from, you can actually see the name in the corner saying Ellie. <laughs> oh, <can you>? oh. <laughs> so yeah, I I I heard of somebody who who from the first minute spotted the name and before she was even introduced, <laughs> he knew who wrote the essay. So. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, no, I didn't notice that. Yeah, actually. yeah okay. I didn't. Me neither. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> but if uh, people who are really, really careful with details, they might have spoiled themselves. <laughs> I think one of the more interesting sides of this whole story is the thought that I had that not only is obesity a really weird addiction to tackle so if you compare it to let's say requiem for a dream where he tackled heroin addiction if someone manages to quit his heroin addiction they are free to never touch an opioid again like obviously their brain craves for it they uh, when they immediately stop they go into withdrawal and stuff like that but they can still at some point completely leave it behind. When you're talking about obesity, yeah, obviously he doesn't need 10 Twix candy bars. He doesn't need the super fat pizza or whatever, but he still needs food, you know? It's still, even if you leave that behind, it's necessary to kind of return for small kicks, I guess. It's it's a really odd it's a really odd addiction to tackle. I don't know about ne- necessary, but like it, you're more susceptible to falling into, you know, because since eating is a daily habit that we all have, is more susceptible to falling, you know, back into mm-hmm. sugar or sodas and all of that and fat. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm saying. It's more of that, yeah. Yeah, that's what what I'm trying to say, because even if he leaves sugar and the specifics behind and only eats healthy food, it's still food that he's consuming. So I assume the brain still gets some of that dopamine rush of, oh, we're returning to this now. Anytime. Oh, I don't think so food. with the, I don't think it's any food. I think it's probably very much towards the comfort food. Okay. And portions. I think Maybe. that's the problem with the uh, obesity, but I'm I'm not quite sure. But mm-hmm. that's my idea of it. Okay. Uh, because you know, if you're eating a salad, it's not gonna get a kick of it. <laughs> it's gonna be like mm-hmm. you know sad, and this brain is probably pushing him towards you know eating something more exciting. I mean, yeah, there's you know the whole part where they fucking film him like a universal monster, you know, during the third yeah. act when he's yeah. just 
eating crazy and just throwing mad different combinations together. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it is about just trying to eat as much as he possibly can of anything that he can get. And I think that's just an exaggeration of the general issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, he's just speeding up what he's been doing anyway. I also think it's kind of fascinating that I can't really recall any other movie really tackling this problem before. Don't know if obesity. I, yeah. Mm. Don't know if something comes to your minds, but if you compare it to other addictions, like there have been quite a few movies about heroin at this point, you know. <laughs> but but uh, obesity is such a common problem, and even in in nowadays with discussions surrounding like. Uh, feeling feeling good about your body and where does body positivity end and toxic you know you're you're just amplifying a problem there where that, does that begin with all these discussions going on i'm kind of fascinated that no one really attempted to make a film about this before yeah not like this i mean there's precious which i don't know if either of you have seen mm -hmm. yeah. i haven't which kind of goes through that, but it doesn't really yeah, it's more of tackle a side that too much. Subject, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's part of it, and I don't know, uh, the Nutty Professor, maybe? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Kind of <laughs> goes into Norbit. it, but... But it's not like an honest portrayal. It's like, you know, it's more for giggles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's wild that, that no one really ever thought they, now is the time to talk about this. I like that the script opens up several smaller topics on the side. So there's this whole aspect of medical attention and uh, religious spiritual guidance, I guess, and the duality of that with the, mm -hmm. the Mormon character. And I really like that he isn't just a punching bag in this. So it is very easy to to, you know, make fun of that character in the story. The story even does that through the, the Ellie character mostly and also through through the Liz character due to their, their former, you know, history with this religion and the, the struggles they had. They have obvious things to be mad about and Ellie's even hatred towards organized religion as a whole can be funny at times like there's there's have been moments where i laughed about those but he still gets a valid reason to believe the things he does i feel like because the thing he says is god has a reason that he sent me here and it sounds super over dramatic but if you think about it he really just arrived in that one second when charlie was home alone and basically about to die at the beginning mm -hmm. of the movie yeah so he really it, it's it's such a miraculous coincidence that I can't really blame anyone who's even like he is a, a person who believes who is a religious person. I can't blame anyone for in that moment thinking, yeah, there's a reason to that. That's not just random. Yeah, I, I absolutely understand why he would think that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not really a religious person, but even I would be thinking that's kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, um... I do, however, think one little thing I don't like about that character, about Thomas, I think his name, yeah. Um, I don't like that there was that weird reveal at the end where we kind of find out that he's homophobic or whatever. I just feel like it was a bit unnecessary. Hmm. I, I, I wouldn't even say that he is homophobic. I feel like it was... It was it's more, more brought up to, yeah, to it's, think like that. Yeah, I, I feel like he, it's more he's having an inner struggle with that topic because the religion he loves and adores so much tells him that it's wrong, but he doesn't have a problem with Charlie. So it's it's more of an inner conflict within him. He's obviously having conflicting emotions surrounding mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, but... I'm not sure whether that really covers it. There's the moment where Charlie's recounting his relationship to Thomas, you know, when they're having that big, like, row or whatever. 
Mm -hmm. Thomas has this kind of thought that the reason why Alan, his partner, died was because of homosexuality. Because he committed the sin and that's why he died. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that's why he's there to save Charlie. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. He's there to save Charlie from dying from the same fate as Alan because of the same reason. But Alan didn't die because he was a, you know, he was gay. I think it's okay for him to dabble in uncomfortability. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to, to outright say and even confirm without knowing that your partner died because he was gay. You know, and that's the reason why you're also going to die. Is fucking insane. I mean, religious people, sometimes they don't have a filter. It's, you know... Mm -hmm. I think it's played well into the, you know, the character. Giving, you know, that is Mormon and all. Not saying that all Mormons, you know, I like this, but... That's what I expect. Like, I, I'm not surprised by that comment. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Yeah, I'm not surprised by it. I just think it didn't need didn't to be there. It wasn't necessary to the story, is mm -hmm. what I mean. You know, with such a tight script, you know, just trying to get through as much as they can. I feel like to also throw in there the weird relationship that Christianity or Catholicism or whatever has mm -hmm. with homosexuality is a bit much. You know, they're already trying to do way too much in that film, and then to throw that in without even really delving into it. They're just, you know, putting it there and then leaving it alone. I had no problem with it. I don't feel it was too over-rushed. I... Like, it, the whole thing lingers around for so long. When he the first time enters the thing, we already hint at it, that they are all familiar with new life, or whatever they call it. And that they all have former history with that. So, I, I you, you can connect the dots at that point easily for yourself. That, yeah, there, there was some problem with new life and homosexuality. I, I didn't feel like it was out of the blue when they brought it up. No, I don't think it was out of the blue. I just don't think or underdeveloped it was developed. Even. Yeah, I don't think it was developed anywhere near enough. Like, I get the whole point of the church group having problems with homosexuality, which led to Alan's death, that's fine. But, as we know, Thomas isn't representative of that group. You know? He... Yeah, but he, he still, he still tries to be representative of it. Like, he, he officially <laughs> isn't on paper, but he's still going around and doing the things that he believes are the right thing. For no, the no, no, I don't mean literally, I mean like he, as a character, you know, because New Life is a character in itself, mm -hmm. and then Thomas is a character. That's why we get so much backstory with him and his parents, and he has just so much individual development that I think lumping him in with New Life as well, it, it's not enough. Not enough in the sense of, like, for it. I'm, oh, for him to I be a representative of the... Yeah, I, mm -hmm. he's either himself or he is new life. I don't think... I don't think with this story you can afford to do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... To me it worked. That's all I yeah, really can... I, I didn't give that much thought into that connection between Thomas and uh, the organization. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me it was more of a decoration. Even the character... Uh, Thomas felt like decoration for me. Mm. I mean, that's fair. One last thing I want to say is that I heard the, the phrase misery porn being thrown around for this movie. Ugh. And uh, not only is it one of those phrases that I hate, um, but I also don't think this movie is at all. Both times watching this in the cinema, the crowd had some really funny moments. Like, that's there's moments like when when he's backing up to the wheelchair yeah, and, and she's making the truck that, yeah. noises. The truck noise, yeah. Yeah. There's the whole haiku she reads where not only is it kind of funny because you didn't expect her to be that rude in the first place, but then his realization that it all adds up to a haiku with like the proper amounts of syllables and stuff. 
that was super funny to me. I think this movie has by far enough humor and things to mix it up to not be I considered mean, misery porn. <laughs> what does that even mean, though? What like, <laughs> like, what does it mean? Like, because who, who cares? <laughs> Aren't horror films just fear porn? Yeah. Right? Isn't comedies just humor porn? <laughs> like, you're allowed to feel miserable. A film yeah. is allowed to make you feel sad. Yeah. Uh, why is that bad? I don't I think understand. When it's people just... mention it, it's like more of an over -exag exaggeration mm -hmm. uh, of the misery that probably doesn't serve the story, which I don't agree. Like, I think it's all pretty balanced. Uh, Charlie suffering and contrasting with this positivity at the same time, I think it's fine. I don't, I mm -hmm. don't see the, the porn here. I, <laughs> I just, I just think it's so stupid. Like, it's such a ridiculous argument to make about any film. Yeah, yeah. Ever. I don't like to use that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, who would say that about Schindler's List? Nobody. But that movie, I'd say, is ten times more miserable than this film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just uh, it's such a dumb thing to say. Mm -hmm. People are so stupid on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you said earlier that the script is not that special. I feel like it's a very small story, but the way it is told is just fantastic. The way everything culminates in that final shot is is amazing to me. All the small arcs they open up with. Oh, the the poem. Uh, the the essay was hers. The he is standing up and going towards her. The obvious ending of we all knew he was gonna die is happening. He is mm -hmm. finally connecting with her in that scene. And as well, just with a really small but effective visual, in my opinion, she's opening up the door first. And even at that stage, we, we kind of illuminate the room and he is standing basically in the spotlight and going towards the light, mm, literally. The light, yeah. yeah, and then the obvious him floating up into the sky is a kind of beautiful contrast to, to him always being tied to the ground early on. Yeah. I was just going to add that throughout the movie, it has always been rainy, gloomy weather, dark, and gray skies. And for, for the first time, we see the sun like mm -hmm. shining that bright. True. So it was also, um, yeah, a nice contrast there as well. Death feels light. I'm going to just say, I don't like the ending. Oh, really? I nearly love it. Up until the moment where he floats. I hate that. Mm. If it were me. Because I think, I think him walking towards the sunny day, his daughter in the doorway representing heaven or whatever is enough to, mm -hmm. you know, and then I think just before the moment, you know, that moment where he hits him and then he starts floating or whatever, I think instead of having that moment, it should have just cut to black. I like it because it represents, you know, the weightlessness that he's feeling right, right then, you know, he's dying and he's leaving everything behind. I, I think it's a good moment, him feeling lightweight and just, mm -hmm. you know, a shining like that. But I guess it's, it's I mean, a matter it's of taste at that point. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I cried a lot. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't I cry a lot cried. towards towards the, you know, like, during the movie, but that ending, I don't know, it just hit me. Yeah, that ending and the first time watching it in, in like, that setting with all those people, that just fucked me up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. As someone that cries at nearly every movie, I didn't actually cry at this one. <gasps> crazy i know all right let's do ratings the first time around this was probably one of my mo most emotional experiences in cinema ever so I, I gave it a 10 i see some problems with it now it's down to a 9 for me but i still love it a lot yeah it's a 7.5 for me their performances paired with the ending made the movie for me uh so yeah 7.5 and i'm gonna drop it on an 8 i think it's a film pretty much entirely dependent on the performances mm -hmm. and luckily pretty much all the performances are like a 10 so 
Yeah, I'm going to give it like an, an 8, I'd say. All right. Which brings us to Requiem for a Dream, the 2000 released Darren Aronofsky movie, following addiction in a few different aspects. What are your first thoughts, guys? Yeah, Requiem for a Dream. So my first time watching this movie was probably when I was 14, you know, feeling emo and I really, really enjoyed it. You know, the editing is just, you know, it's just so fast, the fast pacing, the creativity, it's very appealing to a teenager. Watching it now, I was kind of disappointed because it felt more like an advertisement for don't do drugs kids. And although like I did enjoy my viewing of it, I didn't feel that awe that I felt when I was 13, 14, you know, it was probably the first movie that gave me editing like that, that editing could be done like that, that you could cut scenes so frenetically. So watching it now, I still feel that the overall cinematography of it, you know, all the technical aspects of it still stand and are still very effective. But as a story, it feels like a, a pamphlet, I guess. It just took away from my experience. I didn't get the dread. I didn't get the adrenaline from watching it as I did some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was... Ah, I forgot the word again. Wait. So it was a disappointing rewatch of the movie for me. What about you guys? This is a film that I think is fantastic. I think the performances are probably the best in any Aronofsky film. I think the editing is one of the best edited films I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I think the script is incredible. You know, it's a good film when Jared Leto even gives a brilliant performance. <laughs> but I never want to see this film ever again. I do not care about it in the slightest. Like, yeah. I finished it and I was like, okay, cool. I just don't connect in any way. Like, I, I don't understand why. Like, because I can see from a technical aspect how brilliant it really is. But it's kind of like a film... I'm never going to see again. I will never have an urge to. Mm -hmm. It does feel like, be it said, like a pamphlet, you know? It feels like a, a drug PSA that was really well made. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm over it. I feel like I would have really loved it if I was like 14. It felt groundbreaking at, at 14, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like you're watching something really dark. Do you guys know Christian F? Uh, yeah. The you German. know, it's, yeah, the German one. I wonder if I'm going to like that movie as well, uh, like now as a 25 year old, because back then I enjoyed the movie, but I don't know if I conflicted me enjoying the movie versus me being shocked by what the movie was portraying. I don't know if it will play the same mm -hmm. because I held these two movies at the same level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just put it this way. If Requiem for a Dream came out now, the internet would call it misery porn. <laughs> <laughs> Addiction yeah, you're probably porn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I only watched this the first time a few years ago, so I was quite a bit older. Interestingly enough, I was a bit underwhelmed the first time around. Like I saw the intensity in it and I I felt the energy and I kind of understood why it is as acclaimed as it is. I still thought that some of the stylization felt over the top and unnecessary. It kind of was the other way around with me this time, where returning to it, I appreciated the stylization more than I did back then. I, I still can see some of your points, as in, I am not really eager to return to it either. If I would want to rewatch uh, an older heroin movie, I would probably go train spotting instead. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't even truly put my finger on it as to why. But maybe it is just that, that it is very much a drug PSA. And I don't even think that Aronofsky 
try to do that. I feel like Aronofsky just tried to make a dark story about drug abuse and it just turned out that dark that it happens to be one of the best drug PSAs ever made, you know? Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. It is. But I don't know if it stands as a, you know, a movie that you care about. Mm -hmm. I probably have like one character that I, that I care about. I'm just going to guess. Is that Sarah, the mother? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to put out the the fact that Ellen Burstyn or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Ellen Burstyn. The fact that she did not win an Oscar for this film is outrageous. Yeah. Mm. Her performance is easily the best. And that's like, that's really high praise considering that every performance in this film is great. Every single performance is incredible. But she's just like, she's in a different movie. She is. I think by miles. Uh, they're not on the same level. Mm -hmm. Jared Leto, he gives an okay performance. He's there. I feel like it's still his best performance I've seen. I think of it's, his. His, it's his best. Yeah. No, you guys are forgetting Blade Runner 2049, where, you know, he's just there, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean he, works mess it really, up. He, he works really well in Blade Runner 2049. I'm not denying that. I feel like he did more here. <laughs> well, yeah, he has like three lines in Blade Runner. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, and Fight Club as well. He was yeah. there, but he was... Uh... Yeah, he's fine in Fight Club. I think the one thing about this, like the connecting these three performances is that they are made for a fantastic director, you know? That's kind of the, the one thing yeah. that unites them. I feel mm -hmm. like it really shows that uh, Jared Leto is one of those actors that just needs a good director to guide him. Yeah, like he needs something. There's actors that are independently great whatever you throw at them. I feel like we mentioned Philip Seymour Hoffman earlier. Yeah. I don't think there's a bad Philip Seymour Hoffman performance, so it's probably just no, his, yeah. his class we'll that. That, that carries all of that. But there's these actors that really have some good performances and i would say this is a really good performance by jared Leto, even if it's not on par with his mother character i think honestly the most the most interesting though performance rather not because of the quality of it but just in general is Mullen wayans he plays tyrone because it's the only other one next to a scary movie right like his only other big role isn't it well no he has plenty of big roles he you know he's in a lot of comedy movies and he's really good at comedy you know he's in white chicks obviously scary movie did a haunted house oh he's in air now he's in pretty big films but this is his only real dramatic role mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's fantastic yeah yeah he's really fantastic and to say that you know just before this the only other I mean, this came out the same year as Scary Movie, by yeah. the way. This a Scary Movie came out <laughs> the same year. Imagine the duality. <laughs> which is like a crazy year for this man. Yeah. yeah. He instantly, he was like, okay, I'm gonna establish myself now, but I'm not gonna be typecast, you motherfuckers. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna start on both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> it's so interesting that he never went back to do something like this, to do a dramatic role mm -hmm. it's a standard i mean that that one c oh actually I sh yeah that's spoiler territory i probably shouldn't i mean that, but there's just i guess we can we can go into spoiler territory i don't think that's it's not massive spoilers anyway yeah. it's just a scene where he's running away from something that's oh yeah happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and just his it's acting shooting. in those few seconds alone really stuck with me like i'm sitting here and i'm trying to think of like scenes from the film very like specific scenes that like stuck with me and that's one of the top three mm -hmm. i like when he's alone as well i yeah. don't know it just gives me the sense of being a different person the inner uh, realm of him trying to be a good son for you know uh, in his mo mother's memory i can see and i can feel that sadness of not being enough when he's alone yeah, I wish I wish that storyline of him and his mother, like his past mother, was more developed. Mm -hmm. 
I wish that Sam- was a bigger plot line than it is. Um, I, it's, it's really interesting, and I think I think Marlon Wayans had more to give. Mm-hmm. I would say that apart from Sarah's character, the other three are not given as much love. No, do you guys agree? They're not. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, Sarah's Massively. character is definitely getting the most. Yeah. I feel like, to be fair, it's also for good reason. Mm-hmm. Because she's clearly giving the best performance. Performance, yeah. And so, also... But the... I mean, you would write the movie, you know. Also, if you split it up in, like, general parts of addiction it's trying to portray, the other three are kind of uh, sharing... You know, yeah. they, they are sharing problems with their addictions. You know, there's a yeah, big yeah, overlap. Yeah, yeah. They are exploring different parts of it through those three characters, but it's still one major thing in it, whilst yeah. the mother character is a completely separate thing, and everything we try to explore about that part of addiction, we can only explore through the mother, so it makes sense that she takes over a bigger part. Yeah, I yeah. feel like it's it's less about the individual stories and more about the types of addiction. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, man, she's just absolutely killing it. I, I guess going into spoiler territory, yep. but I love the scene where Harry, Jared Leto's character, is talking to his mom at the table. Mm-hmm. You know, when he yeah. goes to see her, oh, just after yeah. she starts on the diet yeah. pills. And he mm-hmm. starts to try and explain to her that she's an addict. Yeah, she's on a bus. Yeah, and that like kind of clicks to you, right? Mm-hmm. You kind of get it, but then seeing it through his eyes, who, you know, he already is an addict. Yeah. So he could recognize it instantly before anyone else. Yeah. I also wrote down that wrote down that scene. I feel like it's the best acting in the whole movie in that scene. So there's this thing going on where she has basically whilst telling him about the TV and about the diet pills she takes and everything, she basically has an emotional breakdown. She says, "Yeah, I'm lonely, I'm old." I don't have anything to get up for in the morning. But whilst that is going on, she's also portraying being super high and fucked up on uppers. Like, she, yeah. her, her lip is still quivering from the drugs or f- from, like, her portrayal of the drugs as she is having that emotional breakdown. And I feel like at every moment, you can still see both things happening in her performance. Yes, which is honestly, insane. I think I think the best performance in the film is also by her, but um, it's the moment where she's at the TV studio. Yeah, it's the bigger and, outburst for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just I just feel like it's that is the climax of her entire performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the rest is kind of just the epilogue to it all. Yeah. Um. But that that climax of her addiction and distress is insane. And the way they treat different addicts at different stages of their lives is super interesting to me. Like, because she goes to, you know, a a hospital, you Mm -hmm. know, a mental illness hospital or whatever. But Marlon Wayne's character and all that, you know, they go to jail. Yeah. It's funny to see how, how different that is. Now, depending on the circumstances, mm-hmm. when realistically it's the same issue. Jennifer Connelly's character that you know has to do sex work to get her fixed. Yeah, he even points out early in the movie like she's an addict in her own domesticated, socially acceptable way or whatever he, he says. Yeah, uh, that really comes to play when they both get into trouble for being an addict. Like they, they, it even happens at the same time. It's part of the fantastic editing where he gets caught by the police, I guess, and she gets in into the hospital, like, right at around the same yeah, time yeah, in the movie. Yeah. Also, they do just throw in a little bit of addiction to sex, which is super random, with um, Keith David's character. Because, obviously, he's selling drugs or whatever, and then Harry's trying to say, like, how can we buy it? And Tyron's saying, well, you can't. Mm-hmm. He only gives it out to, to women, you know? Because he's he's addicted True. to sex, which is crazy. And it's like such an odd thing to throw in there <laughs> as like just a little side bit. 
because then obviously he hosts those parties as well. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just think like it's such a random thing for him to throw in, and also kind of ahead of its time. You know, sex addiction wasn't really a massive topic yet. When was the whole Tiger Woods scandal? Uh, Wasn't that around 2000s also? Or maybe I'm just mixing up times. I have no idea, actually. I don't don't even know what the scandal was. Ten years later, uh, uh, timeline of Tiger Woods scandal, and it's an article of 2009. Yeah, that was around that time. Um, yeah, Tiger Woods was was uh, like the biggest golf player of all time, uh-huh, and he was yeah. married at the time. But turned out he had like affairs with two hundred women or something like that. Two hundred? Yeah, 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 really. He was he's one of the most prominent cases of sex addict. That is. But yeah, I okay. don't think that was until maybe a few years after Requiem. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I feel like that was mid two thousands. But either way, you know, I just I just feel like it was super crazy for him to tap into that so early, at least. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because even if it was around the same time, to get into something so topical so quickly, mm-hmm. true, is pretty impressive. I just don't know how I really feel. I think it's great, but I also don't really. I love how surreal it gets. It kind of gives me like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind mm-hmm. vibes at times, but I don't know. I feel like the editing and the performances, again, this is like a repeat thing with Aronofsky, where I think the performances are mm-hmm. really driving the entire movie. And then in this specific case, the editing, Yeah, which I don't know, I don't know who edited this film. Okay, it's a guy called Jay Rabinowitz. And I just, I I feel like I would give Aronofsky credit almost for that. Quite a lot of it had to be decided earlier on, like in the shooting process. So it had to be a decision by Darren Aronofsky. I wrote down stuff like for the, for the split screen stuff, obviously, like you, you gotta be prepared for that. It can't be a decision that just the editor makes afterwards. Or yeah, the, that's true, yeah. the, there's this moment when the diet of the mother starts and you have that great sound editing and editing with just her looking at the food. Then you have that plop and the food is gone So with one yeah. sound effect and her reaction to that. That all had to be decided before they shoot. Otherwise, they couldn't pull it off with reaction shots and, you know, the specific perspective and stuff like that the, it's true the match i think i think aronofsky's greatest skill as a director is he puts together a really good crew mm-hmm. he knows exactly who to hire for his specific vision yeah and oftentimes that vision is very specific mm-hmm. for you know sure. the whale is very specific this film is very specific oh, i mean yeah. and he does this like even in The Wrestler, right? With Mickey Rourke. I don't know if either of you have seen it. Yes, I have. But I've mm, not. It's, again, picking Mickey Rourke yeah. to lead that movie in 2008 is such an ingenious idea. Mm-hmm. And a- again, it, it was, I think he got Oscar nominated for that. So, yeah, he did, yeah. So he got he a, an Oscar-nominated performance out of an actor nobody would have expected it from. So Aronofsky just knows mm-hmm. who he needs. And I think that's easily his greatest strength as a director. Because I don't think he even really has a specific style. You know, when you, you can watch four different Aronofsky films and there's not really a, a link. Mm-hmm throughout them you know they all feel like they could have been made by other people the only thing that draws them all in is that they all just have fantastic performances so he must really know one who he needs but two how to direct them i feel like his movies have style for the most part it's not really one specific style like it's you can watch Requiem for a Dream and Black Swan 
without knowing that they are made by the same person and afterwards still not realize they are made by the same person. But I would say both of these movies have a lot of style. So it's it's not like mm-hmm. anyone could make them. I couldn't think of a lot of people who could make Requiem for a Dream, but it doesn't scream I am a Darren Aronofsky movie. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not to say that these films don't have a style. Mm-hmm. I just don't think they have one consistent style, which makes me believe that any like all of these films are an individual case of the specific collection of people making it. Yeah. Rather than because you know when you watch every Quentin Tarantino film, it is so fucking blindingly obvious that Tarantino is running that ship. Yeah, like there's no question about it. Like it's his way from beginning to end. It just feels Tarantino. Same with Nolan. Same with Fincher. But with Aronofsky, it feels definitely like a collective mind. For every single film. You know, like, this film feels like a collection of also the editor's minds and the cinematographer's mind. Mm -hmm. It all just feels like a great... A great composite. Yeah, of all of them. Mm -hmm. And it does that for every other film. Like, The Whale feels like a really good collection of everybody's individual thoughts. And I think Aronofsky's really good at that. He's a great chef. You know, he... He knows the recipe, and he knows exactly what ingredients he needs. Mm -hmm. I like that analogy. The thing that I can see, like, commonly throughout these movies, having just watched six of them, it's that you have this character or characters that are are going through something possibly feverish, like a fever dream, um, you know, exploring themselves and... Uh, at the same time, there's like this kind of hopelessness to it. I don't know if you guys felt that with Black Swan or uh, Mother. You guys mm-hmm. didn't feel, didn't yeah. watch the, the Fountain, right? Yeah, I, I have. And like, and especially here, we feel that hopelessness as uh, the characters are falling into addiction and getting further further away from their dreams, their views of what a good life can be. I think that's that's him. It's you know the falling into a well Mm -hmm. that's where the whale kind of stands from the rest because he's not falling into a well he already fell into the well Mm -hmm. and now we have like the the steps of rehabilitation even though he's going to die but he's taking steps into you know making things right which also applies to the wrestler so the, the oh, I haven't watched that. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I you should watch the wrestler. Thing. Yeah, I think the wrestler is my second favorite. Aronofsky. What's your favorite? Uh, the whale. Oh, mine is probably Mother or Black Swan. To get to some of the visual stuff, I mm. like a re- a really subtle thing that happens early on: the introduction of Marion. The first time we yeah. see her, we look down at her standing in the grass and it's really misleading so you you see this top down view almost looking down at like a little girl she is so innocent just you know <laughs> being out in nature it's absolutely the farthest from her reality we have in the whole movie um just... It's, it's when she's staring at the buildings, right? Yes, exactly. The crooked ones. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's just... <laughs> it's telling that how far of reality he introduces us to her without even saying a lot, just like with one singular image to really make us feel the breakdown and the depth we go with her character in specific. Mm-hmm. She feels like a very light, very... I don't want I I wouldn't say joyful but she's not deep into the addiction right she take, takes drugs for fun and mm-hmm. to see that decline um yeah just kind of sad Did you guys like Harry as a character? He's fine. I think Jared Leto sells him the best that he could be. But I don't think he's necessarily a great character. Yeah. I think I think everyone around him is more interesting. 
I think Tyrone is a more interesting character. More interesting, yeah. And I think Marianne is a more interesting character. I think Harry is most interesting with how he relates to his mother. You think? I I think it's the opposite. What do you mean? Like, I prefer um, the frantic, very, you know, teenage, teenage love that he feels for Marianne. It's very hyped. It's very, I don't know, it feels like a honeymoon, that they are in a honeymoon. I prefer that part of his plot line than the way that he, you know, relates to his mother. Because I don't feel like he's really trying to, you know, make it up to his mother. I don't really feel it. I don't really feel that emotion towards his mother. Especially when he found, found out that, you know, she was taking these uppers and these pills. Uh, I felt like his, his reaction felt very, very short. I don't know. No, I don't mean like, I don't think their chemistry or anything. I just think the ideas of how he relates oh. to his mother is the most mm. interesting. Like how he is an mm. addict and how, you know, she obviously berates him and stuff for doing that and oh i thought you meant like the way then, mm -hmm. you know no but then how she slips into the same thing and how yeah he can see that i think there's an interesting problem going on with the general nature of the addiction where the further they go down the addiction rabbit hole the more this is their only concern you know he in his mind there isn't a lot of space for relating to other people for sh caring about other people's problems because he's constantly having to struggle with that one problem he faces and it takes more and more of his life's energy you know yeah i agree i just for example you were talking before about that scene that's one of my favorites from the movie when they both sit down mother and son uh, by the table and she's like pouring her heart out and she he can see that she's under the influence of you know these drugs that came by a very it the doctor by the way the doctor was phony right yeah fuck that doctor <laughs> it wasn't like real hospital thing it's probably like a clandestine a dietary clinic that scene where they sit down he can basically see that his mother is going through something and she's literally telling him that you know, she feels lonely, that there's no reason to for her to live her life because he's not there, her husband is not there, she doesn't, you know, why should she wash the dishes, you know? So we're getting yeah. this sense of depression from her, of hopelessness, and he just sits there. And I guess I wasn't satisfied with his reaction. I, at that point, you you would expect... Because he wasn't deep into his addiction then. Like, he was addicted, of course, because he's selling his mother's TV every week, right? Yeah. But I think I would have taken a step back at that point. Uh, or I would expect him to do something different to his life in a way that, you know, it could be more aligned with his mother's life. I mean, he did make promises about, you know, dinner and all, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, it just felt not very... I wasn't satisfied. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just took it as he can't really handle problems like these in a satisfaction, satisfying way. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. I, I just took it as that. But I can see... I can totally see how it could feel unsatisfying to yeah. watch that. And that's part of the reason why, you know, his character just doesn't... I can't really connect with it it's just there something i i liked about the visuals as well are those two times they kind of smoothly transition in and out of like daydreaming sequences i guess so there's this one time at the beginning where they are sitting oh yeah at a at a snack <laughs> something at a cafe and a policeman is, is sitting down next to him and he's playing with the idea of you know, tossing her around his pistol. And there's the second one where Marianne is meeting her 
sugar daddy, guess, not psych- sugar daddy. Psychiatrist. <laughs> With a lot of quotes. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> quotation mark psychiatrist. Um, and she is like, thinking about stabbing his hand with, with mm-hmm. the fork. I love how smooth that is integrated. Yeah. The, like, those those things are almost uh, Park chan wook esque I'd say. Yeah, at, at, at the moment... I lift, love that. Yeah, at the moment you don't, you don't feel like, you know, they're slipping into the, the dream realm, where mm-hmm. they, you know, just trying, enacting and imagining uh, their uh, desires, so... Yeah, like the second time, I was caught up by surprise um, that it was an <laughs> imagination, not uh, real. There's some more visuals that that are somewhat uh, Park Chan Wook again. You mentioned Crit the the chase scene mm-hmm. where he is running away, and the camera is like front mounted to his body. I don't know how they did that. Like, I mean, we're talking two thousand right here. There's still no small digital cameras. They were probably all filming on on film. They gotta be right. Like it, it wouldn't look that good otherwise nowadays. So how even did they mount a big film camera, like w- half a meter away from his face to his body? Because it was obviously attached to his body. Otherwise, it w- wouldn't move that perfectly with each and every motion he mm-hmm. makes whilst running away. I'm I'm fascinated by by the logistics behind that. And that also returns somewhat when Marianne leaves the sex addict the first time. She has that same rig mounted to her. She's not running away, but we're following her up to the outside yeah. where she's, I think, puking. It's filmed in the same, you know, putting us in her character way. Yeah, it's the same technique. I, I love mm-hmm. those those shots anyway. I mean, one of my favorite films is Kiddlehood, which came out a few years after this, which I don't expect either of you to have seen. There's a scene exactly like that in Kiddlehood. And it only occurred to me when I was watching Requiem for a Dream that that's probably where they got the idea from. But because I grew up on this film and I really love it, you know, just watching this technique being used, you know, in this film, it just, it like, it made me like it a lot more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, because I already have like a strong relation to a, to a similar scene in a different film. There's also this part of the whole story, or I guess part of Darren Aronofsky's story more as a whole, with Perfect Blue. Mm-hmm. The, oh, the scenes the, with Marianne. The and... animated movie, yeah. yeah. Where there's this section in the movie when Marianne is sitting in the bathtub and screaming to herself underwater. Uh, do, you, do you know about this crit? Uh, sorry, no. Three years prior to this, Satoshi Khan released the animated movie Perfect Blue. Yeah. And there's a sequence in that that is shot for shot, that sitting in the bathtub scene. Aronofsky is a big fan of Perfect Blue. Like, he tried for a while to get the American publishing rights for Perfect Blue and was working on that it get, got, like, an American release. He wanted to get the rights to make a live action remake of it. Oh, I didn't know it was such a Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. really pushing for it and that sadly never happened because I honestly think that he could pu- could have pulled it off. It could have been a really interesting live action remake of an anime and really early on as well like <laughs> that's yeah. early 2000s. Um he also did the scenes in Black Swan, am I right? Yeah, and yeah. I was about to mention since that failed, that's how Black Swan started. Yeah, stands for, yeah. Black Swan is very much uh, his interpretation or reinterpretation of the story of Perfect Blue. It has a lot of parallels. Damn, when a director is a fanboy. Yeah, for real. <laughs> There's probably not a single movie that is as influential on Aronofsky's career as the animated movie Perfect Blue. The only thing I have left is... I freaking love the final of where with cross cutting between the different situations where each of those people are basically reaching their limits. Mm-hmm. The scene where she gets the syringe in the hospital as Jared Leto in a cross cut gets beat up by the police at the same moment. 
you have the infamous yeah yeah the infamous scene we i don't think we even need to mention as marlon wayans character is stomping something with i I don't even know what he had to work there in in the prison but yeah there's visual (laughs) comparisons to be made yeah it's it's super intense again something weird that i can't quite put my finger on it I mentioned with Chunking Express in an earlier episode that I am insanely annoyed by the music that is so repetitively used in it. Whilst I can see that Requiem for a Dream kind of is just as repetitive with the Requiem, the the actual song, the orchestral piece. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It's gotta be just as much used as California Dreaming and Chunking Express, but I love it how it culminates here. Exact opposite, because for me here, the music doesn't really have anything to add it other than, you know, drama and what the music stands for. Mm -hmm. But in Chunking Express, the music is just a push, a recalling of uh, the dream of, you know, leaving that place and fall in love, whatever, all of that. Mm -hmm. So I watched this movie probably 13, 14. I Mm -hmm. used this song for uh, a project (laughs) at school, like a video editing. We had like a, (laughs) I don't remember the theme. I think it was like natural catastrophes. And I put this song there because, you know, I, it was in my mind. And I was like, this is will be a dramatic song for, you know, <laughs> volcanoes erupting. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. <laughs> Earthquakes. Tsunamis. Floods. Da, 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 da. <laughs> As I was watching the movie, I kept remembering the time I was editing said video. And mm-hmm. I, <laughs> it just, I would crack. Like, the music would come up. And I would just giggle a little bit because, you know, uh, just remember what I used it for. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So what are you guys' ratings for Requiem for a Dream? I'm for sure the highest. Uh, The Whale and Requiem are my favorite uh, Aronofsky movies. I have both of them at a nine. I had this at an eight for me, just from memory, you know. But now it crumbled into a six i'm gonna give it a seven just because i can recognize that it's a great film but i just don't feel it Mm -hmm. this brings us to vortex the gaspar noe movie originally released in 2021 the definitely slowest gaspar noe movie at least of the ones that i have seen and for sure the the least violent in his filmography, but I would argue still one of his most horrific pieces of work. Yeah. I watched this movie a while back. It was definitely a surprise to encounter a movie this slow by Gaspar Noé, because we are used to, you know, exciting, shocking, very fast-paced movies by by him, you know? Mm -hmm. And this one takes a very, very slow turn. turn. It's hard to watch, um, not in the sense that it's boring, because I don't think it is, but we are watching the the routines of these two elderly uh, people who are unnamed. We slowly see them at least we see her, the she designer, so I'm, I'm just going to call her she or her. Mm-hmm. We slowly see her decaying in her illness or dementia. Even if it was in a more hasty movie, we would still feel that. But here, Gaspar Noé chooses to portray her loneliness, her feelings of being lost in this apartment that just frames the entire movie, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's her, the world that she knew and the world that she's, she has known 
for you know her life and now she's feeling lost in her own world and it's really heartbreaking to watch this movie and put ourselves in their position or the position of the husband that is sometimes dismissing because he has a lot of things going on it's extremely raw i feel like it's very raw we get these performances from both uh, Dario Argento and uh, Françoise Lebrun that just hit home in a way that it shouldn't, but it does. And it's beautiful that they were able to accomplish such a close to life representation of what elderly people might go through at the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. I will just put it out there that i'm not the biggest fan of french films just in general i've i've seen maybe a grand total of like two <laughs> french films that i really like i know i think it might just be the the english in me but just me me and the french we, you know we've never really clicked not into baguettes <laughs> not really <laughs> it's, you know it's not my bread of choice I'm I'm always nervous going into a, a French film, but this means that I've never actually seen a Gaspar um, Gaspar Noé film, despite being told to see um, Climax and Irreversible a million times. Mm -hmm. um, I just you know it, it's never been for me, and I've always avoided it because I know these are beloved films, and I don't want to be that guy. I just I don't like this film i like i don't hate it for you know i i think it's amazing i think it's incredibly well done i just don't like it i mean maybe it's because i've never experienced anything like this i've never known anyone to have dementia mm -hmm. i don't really know anyone that old i have one grandparent who's been around my whole life and she's completely fine She's mm -hmm. very healthy and very active and stuff. So the relatability of it kind of just falls on deaf ears for me. I feel like the film hinges a lot on that. Because you are just watching over two hours, bear in mind. It's like two hours 20, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, It is just two hours 20 of watching someone suffer from dementia and watching someone like their partner deal with them having dementia. It's a lot because it's not like the whale, you know, like obesity and stuff is a much more common problem, I'd say. But even still, it's a much shorter film and they play around with a lot of different ways that this one thing affects people. You know, it affects the carers and how it affected the partner and how it affects the daughter, how it affects him and the relationship with his wife and all this but in this film it's like it's very much centered around these two and then partially their son mm -hmm. i feel like i don't have a horse in this race it's really sad it is and it's heartbreaking but it's more exhausting to me than anything mm -hmm. by i'd say about the hour and a half mark i was thinking like okay i get it she has dementia like i understand like i think it's maybe the first 20 to 25 minutes Basically, nothing happens. I get, like, it's trying to add in that slice of life. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, aspect to the film. And I love that. I love slice of life or showing the beauty in the mundane and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but it's too much of it. You know? For 25 minutes, all I've seen is her get up, and then leave and just walk around and then him get up and go and find her and it's 25 minutes it's too much i feel like this film is too much of one thing and it's one thing that i don't have any experience or relation to mm -hmm. so it just doesn't hit me it just feels exhausting I can imagine that if you don't have any personal relation to the problems portrayed, then I can see how it mainly ends up being an exhausting experience, for sure. 
I have seen this the first time in cinemas, which always helps a lot with slower movies, even though like the commitment to go to a really slow movie and pay money for it is obviously something else, but just being locked in that dark room, no possible way to distract yourself really puts you into that place where you can't escape. So that helped a lot. I feel like my first watch, I'm pretty much the opposite where I love a lot of French cinema. So I already, both in, both in the ways of the more extreme, um, violent cinema that people like Gaspar Noé or, or more recently uh, Julia Ducanot made, but also also the art house slower side of things. I did, however, not really expect anything, as, as Bia put it, by Gaspar Noé to do that and do it that well. It, it really feels like he stepped out of his comfort zone in a bit and fully succeeded in my opinion and that also without ever giving up on the creative vision that his better movies always have i guess we're we can go into spoiler territory unless you have mm -hmm. something else I, I don't know how much of a spoiler that is but i, I want to get into the split screen thing yeah i think this is the best way I have ever seen split screen used in cinema. I have seen, like, it's not even the first time Gaspar Noé did it. He did it in Lux Eterna before this. And uh, we, we even talked about the movie today already that did it. Requiem for a Dream had yes. a few scenes of that. But this is really so purposeful to me. The way the movie starts off in one screen with them both being in the picture them both being lined up and synced up with their lives you know and then the black bar crawling in as she slowly starts to lose it and and wants to wander off really hit me i saw my grandpa go through that and even in the very beginning when you said um the first 20 minutes felt to you like nothing was happening I saw it basically in her eyes. I, I I knew of the first moment. Okay, she she's kind of losing it right now. She doesn't know yeah. where she's exactly going, and just the way it is portrayed with him not realizing yet as to what is going on. We we constantly see him. We see him work, and I think he's typing at that moment when she first wanders off, and the realization that she's going further and further by the minute really made the the first 20 minutes super intense to me like the, those are those are horrific <laughs> from for me personally but yeah i i can well, see how the thing, a I... lot of that is probably just my personal experience that i bring to it well i had this thought it has to be me i know there's no way that nothing is happening right it's just i'm not getting it and i think i don't get it because i just don't know what it is really Mm -hmm. You know, like I, it's not expressed in a way that I would understand because it is so subtle and probably so real to life. Like it's expertly done. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem for me. It's like, it's so expertly done that I just don't get it. You know, like it's just an experience I couldn't think about. Like I didn't really get she had dementia until he had got her back home. Mm hmm. And then when he was, like, having the conversation at the table, well, more chastising her at the table, I was like, oh, right, she probably has dementia. Yeah. But, like, that didn't click to me for, like, the first half an hour or so. Mm -hmm. But it was probably obvious to most other people. Yeah, I think so. That, that might have been, like, a big problem for you in the beginning there. So, yeah, this is what I'm thinking. I, like, I know the film is expertly done, and I know it's fantastic. I just don't think it's for me. And mm. I can imagine, like, if you go through something like that with a grandparent or a parent or whatever, this film must be incredibly difficult to watch. It must be so hard. Yeah. But it's just, like, something I don't know. You would probably like um, The Father uh, more. I was, I was thinking about that this entire time, actually. Yeah, because... 
this one is like really, really close to life, as you said. It's almost doc a documentary style, not mm. the style, but documentary. You know, the experience, the the heart yeah. of it. Yeah, the experience. Yeah, as in with the father, we have a more putting yourself in the shoes of. It's a lot more trippy, I would say, and you still get the. Um, the emotions and you know and the portrayal of the dementia and i think you will probably like that one more or have you already watched it well yeah i w i i was thinking that um because i was thinking about the father because i was trying to think of other films like this center around dementia mm. and i thought about the father and i know i haven't seen it but one i love anthony hopkins but also i just assume it's a more i don't want to say dramatized but more exaggerated version of dementia like it displays it in a much more well in a much less subtle way yeah it's you yeah. know the big difference is basically that with this one you're looking from the outside in you're more in the shoes of that of dario Argento's character like the yeah that's what i was thinking the, yeah. the people around him and how they are affected or how they try to cope with it whilst in the father you're very much in um anthony hopkins perspective and yeah you're looking from the inside out and therefore you're you're obviously more understanding without knowing it beforehand yeah, yeah. so like i'm i am struggling to like um even justify why i don't like it mm -hmm. you know because it's not the film's fault there are things about the film that i don't like that i just you know sincerely think that the film kind of failed at but I can notice it's great. I mean, as you said, the split screen is an incredible concept for this film. Yeah. Because obviously it's been done before, but mm. it's been it's rarely been done to this extent. And for people that are literally sometimes in the same place, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes when you show on split screen, it's for two different people at different places, you know, but sometimes in this and a lot of the times they're in the same room. They're next to each other, but there's still a split screen. Yeah, they're both and in just, both screens. Yeah, and it's shown us, like, how vicarious their lives are, despite not actually having any real connective tissue besides history. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't really have anything together anymore, except for a past. Also, the long takes are, like, really impressive. Yeah. And made even more so when they cross over, like the perspectives yeah. cross over, because <laughs> mm -hmm. the accuracy of the movements they had to achieve to get the shots consistent mm -hmm. is crazy. Because sometimes it's obviously two cameras, yeah. but then other times it just can't be, you know, where like they're facing each other, mm -hmm. you know, and True. you're like, well, obviously there would be a camera right behind you to film this perspective. So they had to have done the same scene twice to get the other perspective yeah how you know that like the acting is insane the directing is great i can i can for sure say that given watching both darren aronofsky and gaspar no way gaspar easily is trumping him in the directing department like there is so much life in the camera <laughs> itself like it's not just watching these people. You know, the camera itself is trying to tell the story of these people. But there are there are some parts I just I, I don't jive with. You know the opening song? Yeah, I I actually have a note on it. What what did you want to say about it? It's beautiful and it's a good song. But I don't know. Like it feels this this is like <laughs> Okay, this might just be my bias against French movies. <laughs> but French films always have seen like seemed a little pretentious to me a lot of the time. And this one little insertion of this song in the beginning is like it feels I know it's not, but it feels like it the film's going like, ooh, look at me, I'm making a good movie. You know? Like I know what you mean. Of, and I have an interesting thought on it, actually. Um, yeah, so cool. I feel a, a lot of this general feeling towards French films being pretentious. I mean, you're not alone with that sentiment. 
I think it, it, a lot of it stems back from French New Wave and how the general spirit during the French New Wave was anything that is established or anything that is regularly used, we throw all of the out of the window and we'll do it all from ground up, new rules, new everything. So that obviously leads to to that feeling of they feel like they are better than us. They do they they feel like they gotta do everything different. However, this opening with the uh, Mon Amour La Rose, I think was the song, Mon Ami La Rose, is so much <laughs> like you you haven't seen the other Gaspanoi, but the step of uh, Requiem to the Whale is like. Probably the same step that Gaspar Noé took with this movie, but every other movie of his is basically more the Requiem extremity side of filming. And then all of a sudden he made Vortex, which is even further down the artsy, I'm gonna make a slow art house movie now. So the Mon Ami La Rose is instantly, I feel like, to establish, okay guys, just to be sure, I know you expect a certain kind of movie of me. I'm gonna do something completely different now. So it, it instantly establishes kind of this, we're going in this direction of French filmmaking now. And also, I looked up the year of when it got out, uh, that song was released. That song was pretty much released with uh, Gaspar Noé being born. So this is instantly his first connection he draws from he is getting older. He is like 60, I think now. And he can't always stay with, yeah, we'll do a movie about sex, a movie about drugs, a movie about partying, you know, whatever. He's also getting older. Like he is facing those struggles. And that song feels like hell of an old song when it starts playing. But that song is Gaspar Noé's age. That's nice. I think why it feels so pretentious to me is one, one, it feels very, like, Tarantino in the way that it's like, I'm going to use an old song and then I'm going to put it in, like, black and white and change the aspect ratio. You know, it just feels that like... That is the something... original music video of, of that battle. I know, that's yeah. what I mean. Like it, like, it feels like something a student filmmaker would do to make their film look better. Mm -hmm. To use something that's so out of the box. But it's so out of the box, it's in. You know, like it's the first thing I know someone mean, yeah. would would think to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, just, I wasn't a big fan. And I feel like a lot of the film is really on the nose. I hate that some of it is so subtle that I can barely understand it. But then we have the song. And then when she wakes up, the mother, the, the radio is on. <laughs> and the radio's talking about old news. And then when she leaves and she's in the supermarket, that radio's on. And it's all of, all of it is talking about growing old and dying. Like, I get it. Okay, you can relax on the not-so-subtle subtext. <laughs> it's too much. It worked for me since, you know, it, it explored parts of the fears or the, the struggles you faced then that they couldn't really put in that story because it's not the focus of it it's not it's supposed to be this sh short period of time there i felt like it used the additional channel of storytelling well to give us additional ideas surrounding the whole story i dislike when when stuff like that gets used as the main information provider you know as just oh, an yeah, exposition thing and here it it adds little themes to it. It's very obvious with it, sure. I, I give you that, but it, it definitely adds to it stuff that wouldn't be there otherwise. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just felt like there was too much of it. Fair enough. I felt like even doubling up on the radio, they're like so close to each other. It's like within a 10 minute span. It feels like he couldn't decide whether to do one or the other, so he just kept both. But I don't know. <laughs> I made a lot of notes on the visuals. The colors of the poster, the red and the yellow, pretty much throughout the whole film, both protagonists are wearing yet a yellow and red. 
Mm -hmm. So we we have that resemble even the apartment colors at night. Yeah, it's very like exactly orangey. Yeah, exactly, and oftentimes the lighting and it all supports this duality of them drifting apart. And I feel like even the coloring. So both of these colors are warm colors. You know, they're they're trying their best. They are sympathetic to each other. These characters. But they are different colors. They are drifting apart. They are disconnected. There's a moment when she goes to sleep. It, it's like one hour in or a little bit earlier than that. When she goes to sleep and he's still sitting at the couch, we have those bird's eye view shots looking down. When he's in, in his like little room? Yeah. Like that one that with the sofa. Yeah, exactly. He is sitting on the sofa. Yeah. She, is sit she is laying in the bed. And um, the yeah. sofa, the bed, their clothes, and their head together with the split screen almost form a complete yin yang symbol. Oh. It is really fast gone again, but uh, I, I caught it this time and I was like, oh, damn, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for you because you watched it uh, two times. Twice, yes. No? Twice, yeah. Did you get a different experience since we have like you know some most very many scenes with split screen did you notice more of her side or his side hmm i should have probably tried to this time really pay attention to the things that i don't naturally want to pay attention to if that makes any sense mm -hmm. i feel like a, a lot of what the movie does well is bringing our attention to the right part of the screen. Like I, I feel for the most part, you're focused on one screen and really paying attention to that and not really missing anything yeah. at the other that is significant to the story per se. I realized a few times that the Gaspar Noé does this with the, the black screen, super short, it flashes to black. I feel like he did that sometimes only on one side to suddenly guide you to that part of the screen to like, okay, wait, something mm -hmm. is, is about to happen here. You should pay attention to this. So it, it would have been an active trying to watch away from where he wants me to watch. He wants, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think I had pretty much watching wise the same experience where it's not like I I paid attention to the other screen more this time. I think I feel like he is very good with guiding where he wants yeah, you to look. It is a, a testament to his to his skill, you know, because you you do have two subjects on both sides of your screen where things might be happening, and he's able to guide your attention to one side only. Exactly. If, if he wouldn't be good enough with that. Chances are you miss fifty percent of the movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, true. <laughs> and I don't feel yeah, like I missed I, anything. <laughs> I wonder if you go into I I don't know who is the poor bastard that would watch this movie like twice or um, <laughs> three times over just to n focus on one perspective only. True. Each time, you know, and to <laughs> <laughs> see if there is a different experience there. But yeah, you should try it. Now you're like, you know. <laughs> Next watch, that's what you can do. There's a lot of smaller themes in this movie that aren't really that deeply explored, but they come up and I thought they were interesting. So there's this one scene, how you mentioned Crit, when they are sitting inside again. He just brought her home and he is having the talk with her that she can't just run away and she's saying people are kind and he says no they are terrible i thought it's interesting that it's i don't know if this this is even intended it might not be at all but it kind of showcases how fear drives hatred how she is not afraid at all of going outside she doesn't realize where the danger lies in her going outside because she always used to do it and she doesn't comprehend that she will lose direction she doesn't realize that she will get disorientated and doesn't know what mm -hmm, she's doing anymore yeah. which she does so so the fear is missing in her and she she is not afraid or has nothing bad to say about the neighborhood 
whilst all he sees is fear for her and it channels itself even if it was just meant maybe as a lie so that she doesn't go out anymore that he says they are all horrible they are bad people in paris but even if it's just a lie then it's still hatred that sprung out of fear and i think that says a lot about like you know racism or take whatever hate group you you want to put it out that's a good observation interesting i think it's fascinating that this is as we put it kind of the first movie by gaspar noe that that has no classical horror aspects to it like every other movie of his could if at all probably be considered horror or i guess love not but but other than that and this is kind of the the most horrific themes of them all like getting old the fear of dying and for me specifically so much of how i value myself is probably my intellect where i'm proud that i can express myself i'm proud of the things that are things that i learned the things that i know and losing that losing memories losing all the things that i experienced before is probably the most horrific thing i think i'm more afraid of <laughs> you know slowly de- losing yourself yeah, slowly yeah. losing myself than just having an abrupt end to my life that's Yeah, it says uh, Gaspar puts in the movie, he dedicates the movie to all those whose brain will decompose before their hearts, right? Yeah, so true, true. It's very... It's horrific. But I think that while the movie might not be as shocking throughout, you know, mm-hmm. it is a very intense experience. Oh, yeah. But the ending is... Yeah, there's there's parts of this that feel straight up like out of a horror movie, like at yeah. least to me with with like the context and and everything. Mm-hmm. It, I specifically wrote it down uh, surrounding the scene where she empties out his office, where she throws away all the stuff and flushes mm-hmm. it down the toilet. The letters. In the that moment, writing. I feel like it's even as if he really st- he staged it almost like a horror film. At that moment, it's like she is the she is like possessed she's like the demon taking mm-hmm. over her and yeah. tormenting the the residents of the home you know yeah it does feel like that like she's not you know herself like something took over her and she's doing stuff that she knows that she wouldn't do otherwise right mm-hmm. i also like the whole uno reverse card they kind of pull at the end where when he's having a heart attack and laying down on the floor she is sleeping in the other screen and she doesn't realize the problems yet she doesn't realize yeah. yeah and and you have the same situation of god damn it finally please wake up it's it's about time you yeah. save your husband <laughs> which is like just the opposite of the beginning yeah throughout the movie is more of the one who you know mm-hmm. I don't, It's dismissive. It's uh you know, he's living his own life. He has his little club and it's a club, right? A yeah. film critic club. I think book club. But or yeah. a book club. Yeah. Oh, okay. And now yeah, she's the one that is not paying attention. Not because she doesn't want to, it's because, you know, she's fast asleep. Mm-hmm. There's also a scene happening in this which again reminded me of of uh, requiem for a dream um so there's this dialogue between the son and the father mm-hmm. <laughs> i i wrote on the dialogue our home is full of medications and full of druggies indeed that's pretty much the conversation that in requiem for a dream the the son and the mother could have had you know um they are both realizing that they are addicts in their own way mm-hmm. and having an adult and somewhat lighthearted fun conversation about it and making fun of themselves whilst Trequium played in a time and maybe also just because of their different culture in a place where you couldn't have that open conversation and 20 years on at least in France it seems like those conversations about illegal drugs and the problems one might have with them 
can be had. So I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. time yeah. capsule right there. Oh, and one one final thing about the presentation of it all. Crit, you mentioned earlier that in some cases it's not even that they are split up. So you have that that one scene when the father and the son are discussing putting her into or putting them both, I guess, into a retirement home. With the father being on one side. Mm -hmm. Or on the sofa. Yeah, the, the son being on the other, and the mother kind of being split up in the middle, in between them. Really a lovely use case of it. Not only is the discussion mainly surrounding her and her problem, but it is also that she literally doesn't know on which side to stand on, you know, she, she can't comprehend it. Yeah, she's not aware of yeah. what's going on. Exactly. So on my first watch, I loved the whole idea of, okay, they are having different perspectives. And I also got the idea of, okay, even if the sun, for example, takes over one of the screens, that's, those are still two very different perspectives and outlooks on life. And the, the concept makes sense. I was confused the first time around as to why in some of those scenes you would have, for example, when the father dies, I, th I think is the most obvious example, you have the son kind of just laying in the lap of the mother. In both screens, you can see both of them fully. Um, I don't remember the scene. Is it, it's is in the there hospital. like still the split screen? Yeah, it's in the, and, it's, it's in the yeah. hospital. Um, there's still split screen. They are just sitting on the hallway right outside of the room where the father just died in, yeah, in yeah. the hospital bed. And is it like part of their body is in one of the screens and the other in the other screen? Because I, I don't remember exactly the scene. On the left screen, you had a pretty much a close-up of both of them. So you could see them yeah, mm -hmm. taking over a big part of the screen. You had the faces and you could pay attention to the expression. On the right screen, the camera was uh, standing a few meters further back and you could see both of their full bodies on the mm -hmm. um, little bench that they were sitting on. And Yeah, I think I remember, yeah. What I think Gaspanea did there was that even though both fit in both screens, one of those screens is still dedicated to one of the characters each. I feel like that the close-up yeah. shot is dedicated to the Sun character. He is really aware of the situation. He knows what just happened. He knows the father died. He is fully comprehending the situation. Whilst the mother, even though she comforts him, she is still only like semi-aware of what just happened. She doesn't realize her husband just died. So the yeah. camera is really stepping back it's her perspective is a very distant one to the situation to the reality yeah, yeah. she's distant from it she's not really there yeah i, I didn't think about it that way yeah mm -hmm. and he's more in his feelings he's you know and he thinks that he has his mother there you know mm -hmm. probably not fully but he's clinging into that comfort that his mother could give before, but now she really can't give it fully. Mm -hmm. uh, all she can do is stroke his head, right? Yeah. And there's there's even more stuff going on visually. Like you could get into color theory. I looked up a bit. A yellow um, often stands for fear, for impatientness, for betrayal. So, and the father is mostly dressed in yellow. Red is the, the more obvious warmth and love. And, you know, as we pointed out, mm -hmm. she, she doesn't have to fear. She doesn't have the reason to be anything but loving. And then it gets even more interesting because there's scenes where despite him always being dressed in yellow and her always being dressed in red, there's moments when the lighting of the rooms is flipped. So he is standing in a red room and she in a yellow room. And mm -hmm. you could like start to <laughs> go down that rabbit hole and try to analyze, okay, what's what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's the color implication here now? But yeah. Dora yeah. the Explorer, but, but for colors. Yeah, for real. 
there's I, I I think there's a lot in just the the nuances that has went that went into the decisions being made. And also, as I pointed out earlier, uh, and I forgot kind of about that, the fact that this is kind of like the biggest fear, the biggest horror of it all. And then he <laughs> went ahead to cast Dario Argento as the main character. Yeah. <laughs> how how perfect is that? I, I it might be my favorite meta <laughs> meta acting ever and <laughs> casting ever. Yeah, I I freaking love this movie. There's something about super in intense extreme directors suddenly making a slow, intimate, small story, and and it just gets me. I similar to to the premiere of the whale. I was crying insanely much uh, watching Vortex the first time in the cinema. Uh, uh, well, couldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. It, it hit me. It hit me quite a lot. Like just the 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 scene when he's dying, um, it's so painful to watch. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen a death portrayed like that ever. And even how one part of the screen, like his part of the screen, just stays black after that. Uh, just that visual of mm -hmm. half of the screen is gone now. Like we yeah. lost that half of the screen. We lost him. It really made you feel it. it God damn, that's yeah, the absence, yeah, for sure. That hurt. That hurt. That hurt. Did Gaspar? Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> Just having us confronting death on screen like this. Mm -hmm. So we want to do ratings. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do ratings. <laughs> I I don't blame you at all, by the way, for for not enjoying this and. Any listener who who might be like, yeah, that was boring and slow. It's a very artsy movie. I am aware. It is. I can't physically put it a five or below. Because that would imply that it's average or bad. I'm going to give it a seven. Same as Requiem. Mm -hmm. Same as Requiem. Because it, it's the same. It's the same thoughts behind it regardless. Like. I can see how well made it is, but I just don't mm -hmm. have the interest in it personally to put it anywhere above that. Fair enough. Yeah, it's at a 8 for me. It's a 9 for me. A pretty high 9, gotta say. And that's a wrap on today's discussion. Next week, we are diving into the Evil Dead franchise. Starting with Evil Dead Rise, the latest entry to the Evil Dead family being praised by the public and critics for still keeping up the reputation of the franchise. Directed by Lee Cronin, starring Lily Sullivan and Elisa Sutherland. We'll also be watching Evil Dead, the 2013 remake of the original 1981 classic. It's one of the few remakes of an already classic movie that truly deserves its title. Directed by Fede Alvarez, director of Don't Breathe, another contemporary horror film of much acclaim, we'll be experiencing the true horror potential of this franchise. We are also going to watch The Evil Dead, the 1981 directorial debut by Sam Raimi. It was a super low budget movie that Sam and DIY fashion made with his friends in the woods and slowly grew into a phenomenon. It is known for his practical effects and generally shocking scenes for its time. If you don't want to get spoiled for any of these three movies, you have two weeks to prepare. I'm George. I'm Bia. I'm Crit. And you are listening to Three Euros Per Movie. <laughs>